And they all introduce our speaker today. Well, I'm pleased to introduce Dan, the Birdman, Shiman. Uh, yeah, yes. Uh, Dan, it's Dr. Dan Shiman. Uh, we are very fortunate that he's going to be here today. I know we sent out a bio earlier in the week in Crystal Reflection, so you know all his credentials. But basically, he's going to be talking to us about creating that bird-friendly yard that you want so that you will see all of these beautiful birds, you know, when you're out in your yard and relaxing. Um, also, I wanted to mention, uh, many of you probably talked to him a few minutes if you, before the meeting, but if you have questions, make sure you ask him about those particular plants that you want to have in your yard to lure those birds in. Dan? Thanks, Gail. But keep in mind that I am an ornithologist, not a botanist, but my job is to promote the use of native plants to help the birds. Um, that is my position with Audubon Delta. Audubon Delta, if you're not familiar, is a regional office of the National Audubon Society, which is a nonprofit conservation organization with a focus on birds. Previously, I was with Audubon, Arkansas, but a few years ago, Arkansas, Louisiana, and Mississippi merged to form Audubon Delta, so we have a more regional focus for more uh, regional conservation impact, and my job is to promote the use of native plants across the three-state region. So by being here today, I assume you definitely want to create a more bird-friendly habitat in your yards, or it could be in your schoolyards or churchyards or businesses. What I'm talking about today applies to all of those situations, so think more broadly. Uh, but uh, one of the reasons that we need to be creating spaces for birds in our yard is because birds are in decline. You may remember the headline news from 2019, a study from the Cornell Lab of Ornithology, that we've lost nearly two, we've lost nearly three billion birds since 1970. That means there's um, one in four birds fewer nowadays uh, than there used to be. And this affects all sorts of birds, even birds we think of as being very common right now. There are fewer of them around now than there were just a few decades ago. And the reasons behind those declines are numerous and varied and uh, depends on the species, but one of those reasons is the loss of habitat due to urbanization. This is what's relevant to our talk today about creating bird friendly yard. And to illustrate what I mean by habitat loss through urbanization, I'm going to quickly show you a few maps of housing density across the country as a uh, proxy for urbanization with high housing density in red and open country, open space in green. So it was just a few decades ago that urban areas were largely small and consolidated, but then populations started growing and urban areas started to expand through uh, suburbanization and how, new and new housing developments, mowing down more and more acres of what was once open country and ecologically favorable land um, to form housing development. And this is essentially what it looks like today. There's, you can see across especially the eastern part of the United States, it's a lot of urbanization. Here in Arkansas, Central Arkansas is growing like crazy. Northwest Arkansas is one of the fastest growing places in the country and all the time is more and more open space being converted to housing developments and businesses. And that trend's only going to increase. Yeah. And this is what a lot of those new housing developments look like. We've all seen them. Um, it's a lot of lawn. There's like 150 million acres of turf grass in the U.S. last count. 
lawn is not good habitat. Sure, some robins, maybe you'll forage on the lawn, but mostly lawn is sterile. It requires a lot of water, fertilizer, and such to stay green. Lawn is not good bird habitat. Um, so a lot of lawn, maybe a few trees, maybe some ornamental shrubs and flowers, but basically th this kind of landscaping is meant to be neat, to be simple, to be easy to maintain, to celebrate lawn as a status symbol. But it is not meant to share our space with other living creatures. If you were a migratory bird on your long journey between South America and Canada, there'd be nothing for you here. No place to rest and refuel. You'd have to keep on going. Fortunately, we can change that. There's lots of things that we can do to promote birds in our yards and to reduce the threats that birds face in our urban environments. And I'll go through each one of these in turn. The foundation of a bird-friendly yard are native plants. The plants that were here before European settlement, the plants that our birds have evolved with and adapted to and recognize as being food and habitat. Currently though, this tends to be the criteria for choosing plants in our landscape. Is it pretty? And if it's pretty and will grow in that space given the soil, water, and life conditions, then plant it. But what I'm asking you to do is to balance that with the ecological values of the plant, especially the food web value. What critters eat that plant? What role does it play in the food chain, in an ecosystem? We need to be thinking about our yards as ecosystems. And I would argue that native plants balance these things. They are both beautiful and functional. So for birds, plants provide food. Plants for birds. Plants provide food. Um, they provide a lot of fruit, especially woody plants provide fruit for birds, and also provide, for us, they provide beautiful fall foliage, beautifully colored fruit, um, there's so many good woody plants to choose from that provide fruit at different times of the year. Beautyberry is a great one. Beautyberry is tolerant of full sun, of full shade, dry conditions, wet conditions. Uh, you can, if it gets too big, you can cut it to the ground and it will just come right back up again the next year. In fact, it actually fruits and flowers on new growth, so it's one way to stimulate the fruiting. Uh, and it does tend to be widely available when it comes to native plants in, in a lot of nurseries. So it's a good one to have. Seeds are also important. Of course, when, birds are, when the flowers are done flowering, they form seeds and birds go after those seeds. There's a picture of the goldfinch there. I took that in my yard. That American goldfinch was a few feet from my feeders. But it didn't want the seed. It wanted the goldenrod seed. It wanted the coneflower seeds. It wanted the seeds from the native plants and not the sunflower seeds that I had in the feeder. And if you are into providing seeds for birds, think not just about flowers, but grasses. Grasses are really powerhouses of providing seed, and they also provide cover for birds. Uh, grasses and sedges, too. Uh, and um, in fact, there's a lot of talk about trying to replace lawn with sedges. There are some sedges that are low growing, they are tough, they're shade tolerant or sun tolerant or drought tolerant. Um, so sedge lawns are a great alternative to regular turf grass lawns. They provide cover, they provide food, and they don't need nearly as much maintenance as most turf grasses do. And they're beautiful all 
season long, all year long. Lots of great structural interest from grasses, especially the big bunch grasses. When it comes to providing nectar for hummingbirds, lots of great plants to choose from with red tubular flowers. Uh, Turk's cap is one of my favorites. Turk's cap is another one that's really tolerant of a lot of conditions. Turk's cap will bloom from July to frost. So the whole time hummingbirds are migrating through, there are Turk's cap flowers for them to feed on. And, and Turk's caps, are, they, will, they can spread over time and fill in an area, or you can cut them back and control them. But of course, a flower does not have to be red and tubular to attract a hummingbird. They will feed on a wide variety of flower colors and shapes, from blazing stars to milkweeds to various sunflowers. And then, of course, these plants will provide nectar for a wide variety of insects, bees, wasps, butterflies, and so on. And it's really insects that are the key for native plants because insects even more so than birds are evolutionarily tied to native plants with generally an insect can eat only one type or a limited number of plants that it has evolved with so think about monarch butterflies sure Adult monarch butterflies can feed on a wide variety of flowers, including non-native lantanas and buddleias and zinnias. But monarch caterpillars can eat only milkweeds, only native milkweeds in the genus Asclepius. So if you really want to help the monarchs and make more monarchs, you have to have milkweeds in your yard. And that's the rule in the insect world. And milkweeds have evolved to caterpillar foraging. Uh, I've seen milkweeds get eaten to the ground by caterpillars and they just pop right back up again and flower. And generally, native plants are very tolerant of being eaten. Uh, something like, I think like 60% of the leaf area can be eaten on a lot of plants and they will pull through just fine. And that's the main food source that we're talking about for birds. It's insects. 96% of all land birds feed their young insects. Not seeds, not fruit, not nectar, insects. Uh, so to illustrate that, I will cite a study that looked at chickadees. And they found that a chickadee pair brings between 390 to 570 caterpillars to the nest per day. Wow. <laughs> it takes 16 days to fledge a clutch of chickadees. So 390 to 570 times 16 is 6,000 to 9,000 caterpillars needed to raise one clutch of chickadees. So now imagine how many caterpillars it must take to raise a bigger bird like a cardinal, or a blue jay, or a pileated woodpecker. And you can see why insects are so important for our birds. Another way to illustrate that is to compare native to non-native. So non-native ginkgos that are popular ornamental plants support only three caterpillar, four caterpillar species. Whereas our native oaks support over 500 species of caterpillars. Oaks are really, really great insect food. So if you really want to feed the birds, you should plant an oak, right? If you were a parent chickadee looking for caterpillars to feed your babies, the difference between a ginkgo and an oak can mean the difference between life and death for your baby birds. Why we gotta plant the native plants. So if I haven't convinced you to plant natives yet, there are some books, some authors I recommend. One of those is Doug Tallamy, 
who has a number of books, including Bringing Nature Home. Uh, how many of you saw Doug Tallamy at the Flower and Garden Show a number of years ago? Uh, well, just a couple of you. Um, he's got to come back then. The Flower and Garden Show is gone, I guess, but Doug Tallamy needs to come back, maybe to the statewide Master Gardener meeting one of these years. He's a, a researcher at University of Delaware. He studies the plant-insect-bird connections, and in his book, multiple books, he makes the scientific case for why you should plant natives. But he does so in a very easy to understand way. He's a really good science communicator. So I really like his books. He has a whole book just on oaks. <laughs> You're not convinced about oak trees. And then the other author that I like is Benjamin Vogt. He is a, a landscaper in Nebraska. Uh, and yes, he talks about the science, but he also comes at it from more of a philosophical standpoint, how we have a moral obligation to restore habitat that we have destroyed. And he is about more than just using plants as aesthetic pieces about, as ornaments to admire, right? He's not saying, he doesn't want, he wants you to go beyond planting a tree here, a shrub there, or a little flower clump there. He wants you to recreate a prairie, for example, in your yard, to think about all the species that co-occur in an area and to plant them <coughs> together and let them do their thing. They're going to move around, they're going to compete with each other, but they're going to form, at some point, an ecosystem that hosts a diversity of insects and other animals that, in this way, we kind of recreate that lost ecosystem in our yards. It helps stitch back some of that landscape that has been lost. <coughs> um, he really challenges us to rethink pretty, and I really like that. Another model of his is prairie up, because he wants to recreate prairies. So he's a good motivator. He's got uh, a Facebook page, a website. Uh, there's also a whole, like, for, for a, you can join, like, his paid section and be part of ongoing discussion and watch videos about how to garden with native plants. He's also a big proponent of the sedge lawn. So, what is a native plant? Where can you get native plants? Well, there are a number of sources, but one of them is to go to National Audubon Society's Plants for Birds Native Plant Database. If you Google Audubon Plants for Birds, you will come to our database. You put your zip code in, and it will give you a list of plants. I'll let you take a picture there. Audubon.org slash native plants. But you put your zip code in and it will give you a list of plants that are native to your area as well as the birds that are benefited by those plants. And then there's also a resource section as well that lists some of the places where you can learn more about native plants like our Native Plant Society uh, and places where you can buy native plants. Now this is, is one of the challenges with native plants in Arkansas and really around the country is that the supply is not there to meet the demand in many places. Or it's not evenly distributed because we have so few native plant suppliers around. Our biggest one listed there is Pine Ridge Gardens in London, Arkansas, just north of Russellville. But there are some other ones in, uh, in around Little Rock, in, in northwest Arkansas has some. Um, um, sometimes they go to farmer's markets and sell native plants. Um, but uh, there's not that many of them. So one of the ways that you can help is to start demanding native plants. Go to your garden centers, your, your plant suppliers, and ask for native plants. Print out the list from Audubon's database and say, I want these plants. And if there's enough demand, the supply will increase to meet that. I have talked to some members of the green industry. They're hearing it from their customers. They're getting it. It's starting to spread. It's not quite there. We want them to increase it. Uh, also, I guess here I could say a few words about 
native cultivars or native ours. Oftentimes that is what you will find in garden centers, like, um, like echinacea, coneflower. Oftentimes you'll see echinacea powwow or something like that, where it's just electric pink coloration. It's not the natural color. Are native cultivars good for birds and insects? It depends. There are limited studies out there that look at them. Uh, depends on the species, depends on what traits have been changed. Uh, because oftentimes when, you, when we breed for one trait, it also affects other traits that are genetically linked to that, and we didn't mean to change that. So if you, for example, create a double flower, Usually that's at the expense of the nectar. So the double blooms have less nectar or lower quality nectar. So if you change the leaf color, does that affect the chemistry of the leaf? And does an insect no longer know that that leaf is food? Can it not, does it taste the leaf and say, hmm, that doesn't taste good anymore because the color changed? What other chemistry of the leaf has changed? So some native ours have been tested and are perfectly good. Some are not. Do your homework. Try to stay with the straight species if you can. Are there websites where you can find which ones are still good for birds? Good question. Are there websites, she asked. Um, the Mount Cuba Center, Mount Cuba Center, has done research about cultivars. So they do have some articles on their page that go over some of those species. Mount Cuba Center. All right, now there's other things we can do to provide for the basic needs of birds that are living in our space. One of those is to provide cover and shelter for the birds, places for them to nest, to hide from predators and the elements. Uh, again, there is research to suggest that native plants provide better cover than non-native plants, especially when it comes to shrubs. Uh, it has to do with the branching architecture of the different species, and whether they absolutely conceal the nest or not. So we want to have some good, like, evergreen plants to help provide cover for the birds. Snags, standing dead trees, or dead parts of trees, if these are not a, an immediate threat to your yard or your neighbor's property, Leave them standing, because they provide great habitat for birds. Uh, of course, woodpeckers will build their nests in snags, uh, and other birds then will move into the woodpecker nests when the woodpeckers are done. Woodpeckers and other birds are, of course, looking for the insects that are feeding on the dead and decaying wood, and they make great perches for swallows and Mississippi kites and all sorts of birds. Also, if, um, if you have a real tall tree that has died and you're afraid it's going to fall over, consider cutting it down to, say, 10, 20 feet so it's no longer a, a threat to fall down and hit something. So you leave that stub standing and it still provides the dead, decaying wood that woodpeckers and other birds could use. This is one of my favorite tips is to leave the leaves. Uh, we should be calling it leaf habitat, not leaf litter, because it's not litter. It is valuable natural resource. There are so many insects that require leaf litter to complete their annual life cycle. They're spending the winter hidden in the leaves as eggs, larvae, pupae, even adults. And if you rake up all your leaves, put them in the garbage bag, and they get hauled off, you're taking away all that bird food. The birds know the insects are in there. If you've seen birds scratching through the leaf litter, they're looking for insects. Don't take all that food away. You want those insects to be able to come up in the spring and keep on reproducing and feeding the birds. Uh, so in my yard, uh, I will leave the leaves on the lawn all winter long. Uh, by spring, I will mulch mow some of that if I need to. 
I'll leave the leaves in the garden beds. Uh, and the leaves in the garden beds are also valuable because they provide all sorts of benefits for our plants. They help to insulate the roots from cold temperatures. They retain soil moisture. They help to provide fertilizer as they break down. So leaves are really valuable. Why rake the leaves away and then spend money on wood mulch when you have all this free mulch? Also, for the, for the leaves on, the, uh, on my sidewalks and, and driveway, I'll bag it up and save it for my compost pile throughout the year. I really try to keep the biomass of my yard in my yard as much as I can. And speaking of that, along those lines is to try to embrace the mess. <laughs> uh, yeah. <laughs> So one thing I've learned in, in my years of uh, native plant gardening, and I should add, uh, I do have an all Arkansas native plant yard in Little Rock. Uh, although I, I, I'm not saying you have to go home today and convert all of your yard to native plants, but when you have a choice, choose natives. Integrate natives into your yard. If you've got your roses and your gardenias that you love, fine, cool. But if you're building a new garden bed, if you're replacing a dead shrub, choose a native plant. Anyway, I've got it all Arkansas native plant yard. Admittedly, I did buy my house from Theo Witzel, who's the expert botanist <laughs> the Natural Heritage Commission. So he spent eight years before me converting it to the all Arkansas native yard. So he did all the hard work. Uh, but although I have been adding to it, maintaining it over the last, going on 13 years now. So uh, it is a pleasure for me as well. But I digress. So another good thing to do for the insects is to leave standing dead vegetation. Uh, when I first moved in, I used to grab every single plant stalk in February with a clipper and clip every single stem at the base and bag it all up and get rid of it. But I have since learned that there are lots of insects that use those standing dead stems. Native bees, especially, will nest. They'll burrow into those pithy stems and lay their eggs in those stems uh, in early spring. So throughout the summer then, the bees are completing their life cycle. And then by the end of the summer, those stalks are basically just degrading down. And then there's new stems that are forming. So it's a continuous cycle. So since I learned that, now I just take my long clippers and just messily clip, clip, clip here and there, you know, at different heights, let things fall on the ground and degrade in the yard, and I save so much time. What used to take me multiple days to clean the garden, now I can do it in an afternoon. And it's a little bit messy looking, but it's more natural and it provides better habitat for insects. Now, of course, we do want to make our yards look neat and intentional to some degree. We don't want to get in trouble with the neighbors. We don't want to get in trouble with the property owners association. So there are things to do to make your yard look intentional. Things like keeping your edges nice and neat and mowed, having paths through the gardens, having traditional things like picket fences and a water fountain and signs. So even though Benjamin Vogt advertises, promotes natural yards, he's still all about making it look intentional and planned, which they are. So we do have to maintain them to some degree. How many of you feed the birds seed and suet and such? Excellent, excellent. Keep in mind that we feed the birds because we want to, because we want to bring the birds close to us to watch not because they need our food to survive. Common yard birds that come to the feeders every day are still getting some of their diet from natural sources. Uh, really only in times of deep freeze and frost are our feeders really important lifelines. Otherwise, it's for our enjoyment, not for them. But the main thing to keep in mind when feeding the birds is to clean your feeders on a regular basis in order to prevent the spread of disease. So every couple of weeks, take your feeders down, hot soapy water, 
maybe a little wheat bleach or vinegar if they're really yucky looking. If the dishwasher's safe, put them in the dishwasher. Uh, or if your seat gets wet from the rain, then you want to get that moldy stuff out of there, dry them off, and before you refill them. Same thing for bird baths too. Uh, keep your bird baths clean, especially, well, in the summertime, it's obvious. Every few days you get that green or brown gunk in there. You've got to rinse them out, scrub them out. But even in the wintertime, even though there's not algae growing in there, birds are still pooping in it and bathing in it, and you've got to keep it clean every few days. Soapy water, clean them out for the health of the birds. <coughs> A copper penny keeps the algae down. Really, that's good. Good to know. Good trick. It works. All right. So I will try that. I'll try that this summer. Thank you. Okay. There's also some hazards we want to remove that birds encounter in our urban environment. Uh, one of those is pesticides. Uh, there's about 80 million pounds of pesticides applied to lawns in the U.S. every year. And pesticides will harm not just the pests we're going for, but also beneficial insects that come in contact with it. And then if a bird eats the insect or the rodent that's ingested the pesticides, the bird can also become sick or die. So really, we want to limit your use of pesticides as much as possible Follow the label, use it in a targeted manner, try to look for organic or mechanical alternatives as much as you can. And again, keep in mind, the whole point of planting natives is to feed the insects that feed the birds. So when you've got insects chowing down your plants, you go, yes, great, it's doing its job. Now, the, uh, the no pesticide thing, does get a pass when it comes to invasive species. So these are ones where you do need to use a little bit of herbicide to control them because these plants are highly invasive because they don't stay in our yards, because they get spread into the natural native environments where they outcompete the native plants and reduce the overall biodiversity of our natural areas. And state agencies, conservation groups like Audubon and Nature Conservancy and Game and Fish spend so much money and time trying to fight these invasives. Don't let your yard be a reservoir for more invasions. If you've got honeysuckle, if you've got privet, kill it. You gotta cut it down at the base, paint the stump, and probably do that multiple times. And also, once you've taken out the parent plant, you're going to release all the babies that were hiding in the soil. They're going to all come up. So it may take time, but you've got to control the invasives. Nandina is especially bad because Nandina is poisonous. All parts of it contain hydrogen cyanide. So if a bird like a waxwing eats enough berries, they will become sick and die. So if you're not going to kill your Nandina, at least clip off the flower stalks when they're done flowering so you don't produce berries or get the kind that does not produce flowers and berries, or replace it with one of dozens of beautiful native alternatives. Another major threat to birds is windows, window collisions. Um, yeah, collisions with glass is one of the major sources of mortality in, well, around the world, really. Um, one billion birds die in window collisions in the U.S. every year. One billion birds. Birds cannot see glass. They don't know what that is. Instead, they either <coughs> see a reflection of the outdoors and think that they can fly into it, fly through it, um, you know, or they see if it's got like you know, two panes of glass, it's a corridor to them, and they fly right into that stuff. And either they hit and die, or they hit, bounce off, fly away, but many of those birds die of internal injuries later on. So this is a major source of mortality for birds, but there are lots of simple solutions 
to this. It's all about putting some kind of visual barrier there to let the birds know they can't fly through. So you can do things like put up decals, or screens, or hang cords. Uh, but whatever you do, oops, whatever you do, it's got to be a regular grid. You can't put a decal here or decal there because research has found that birds will move through a gap as big as uh, two by four. So it's got to be a regular grid or a full on screen in order to keep birds from flying into that. So this is a picture of my windows that face my feeders. And I've got parachute cord, which you can get at Home Depot, hanging down every four inches. I just put a command hook at the corner of each window frame, put a string between the command hooks, and then tie it off the parachute cord every four inches, hang it down. The stuff blows in the slightest breeze and provides that visual barrier for the birds. And then here you can see one of my two cats, which brings me to the next point, is to keep cats indoors. Cats are the number one killer of birds, number one predator of birds, worldwide. After climate change and habitat loss, it's cats, outdoor cats. Outdoor cats kill an estimated 2.4 billion birds in the U.S. every year. That number is not sustainable. Why have we lost nearly 3 billion birds since 1970? Cats are one of those reasons. Coming from a cat lover, this is coming from a cat lover. Keep your cats indoors. That only helps the birds. Indoor cats lead longer, healthier lives as well. Indoor cats don't get into cat fights and get diseases. They don't get mauled by dogs or coyotes. They don't get hit by cars. They don't get taken away by well-meaning people who think they're strays. Keep cats indoors. I know it can be a controversial topic, but got to do it. And lastly, there are personal actions that we can take that are not always necessarily directly about birds, but they're a way to reduce our impact on the environment. So you may have heard of the slogan to think global, act local. Well, that's, you're doing stuff in our backyard is a perfect example of that. We're facing some big problems, like I mentioned, climate change, habitat loss, sometimes it's like, ah, these things are so big, I can't do anything about that. Well, you can, right? You can control your yard. That's the space where you have full control and you can do something, which includes planting natives, but also includes things like putting in rain barrels to capture water, to, rain, to water your garden, using energy efficient appliances, composting, all those sorts of things. You can also Make your bird watching count for the birds by participating in community science programs like the Great Backyard Bird Count, which, not coincidentally, <laughs> starts tomorrow, people. <laughs> so for the Great Backyard Bird Count, basically, it's a four-day window over President's Day weekend, Friday to Monday, and you just need to spend as little as 15 minutes watching birds wherever you are. It's called the Great Backyard Bird Count. It started in backyards, but now you can watch birds anywhere. You can watch birds in your local park, in the National Wildlife Refuge, in the Walmart parking lot, for all that matters. <laughs> you watch birds, you keep a list of the birds you've seen, note the time, location, go to the website, put your birds in, and this way, all of our individual sightings all add up to a big picture all across the continent, or really all across the world now. The GBBC is global. So all around the world, all of our individual sightings add up to a big picture of how birds are doing in midwinter. And then there's, there's other um, community science programs to account for other times of the year. There's the breeding bird survey, the Christmas bird count, there's eBird for year-long bird watching. Nest watch, feeder watch is another good one. And then you can also help by spreading the bird word or the plants for birds word. 
And there's really no better group than Master Gardeners for spreading the plants for birds word. It's because you all work on demonstration gardens and other people's properties, and this is your opportunity to demonstrate native plants, to label native plants, to talk to the garden owners about why you're planting a native instead of a non-native that maybe they were hoping you would have planted. Uh, and of course, I would be remiss if I didn't mention how much I appreciate Master Gardeners because you all help us, Audubon, we have a group of master gardeners led by Jane Gully who work on our native plant landscaping at the Little Rock Audubon Center. So once a month, they come on over and I, we all work together to do maintenance, management, planting, all that kind of stuff in the native plant gardens at the Little Rock Audubon Center. So I greatly appreciate master gardeners for all you do. And I think you all can be fantastic ambassadors for for promoting native plants to help birds. And then if you want a sign to show that you help plants, help birds in your own yard, well, there is a Bird Friendly Yard certification program by our sister organization, Arkansas Audubon Society, which is a state-based group, all-volunteer group of birders uh, actually, I am on the Bird Friendly Yard Committee, so I'm wearing two hats right here. Um, so, for the uh, Bird Friendly Yard Certification Program, you take actions like planting natives, putting in a rain barrel, planting a pollinator garden, keeping cats indoors, and you get points for those things. When you have a certain number of points, you turn your application in and you get the Bird Friendly Yard certification sign for your yard so you can show it off. So when your neighbors, your friends, your families come around, they say, what does that mean? That's your opportunity to talk about how your yard is bird friendly and what they can do in their yards. And then also I should mention, even if you're not there yet, don't have enough points, you can still turn your application in um, and get the pink working to become bird friendly yard sign. <laughs> so you can tell people you're on your way to that. And then you can be part of our statewide network of bird friendly yards. So I really appreciate your time and attention and be happy to answer any questions you have. Are there some honeysuckles that are good? Because I noticed you said Japanese honeysuckle are the invasive. Right, Japanese honeysuckle and bush honeysuckle are the two invasives in Arkansas. Uh, trumpet honeysuckle with red flowers, that is the native honeysuckle. That's a Linicera sempivirens. And that's, a, of course, a hummingbird magnet. It starts flowering at the time the hummingbirds arrive, and it really flowers all summer long. And really, in, even to the fall, a healthy plant will have very persistent blooms. And then provides berries. Yeah. So, I bet I'm not the only... Uh, thanks. I bet I'm not the only one in this room that has used uh, a pesticide service in, in your home. Um, and some, some... I can... I can repeat the question. I'll repeat the question. Okay. Turn it off. Thank you. Okay. So, talk about a, a pesticide service for your home. Because I, I appreciate and respect bugs, but I don't really want them in my house. <laughs> so, um, is there a, is, is there somewhere I can get a list of uh, pesticides that even I could either use or have my service use? that would be effective, but not create any issue uh, for the boundary of my house. Yeah. For the, for the birds and the other, and the, and the good insects. Sure, yeah, she wants to know what pesticides you can use to keep pests out of your house. Yeah, I, I mean, I don't want pests in my house either. So I got a company that comes and does quarterly spraying around the edges inside and outside of my house to keep out the roaches and the earwigs and that kind of thing. And um, I'm, I'm blanking on the chemical they use, but I know it's a, it's a plant-based chemical because it's also safe for my cats, too. 
Yeah, so I mean, if you, so yeah, you can, you can hire a company to do that spraying and just make sure, ask them to use a, a safe chemical, let's say for you and your pets. And if you're spraying just the border of your home and inside your home, then it's highly unlikely that insects and other, you know, beneficial insects that are visiting flowers will come in contact with that stuff. It's the indiscriminate spraying all around the plants, it's the mosquito spraying through the neighborhood. That indiscriminate spraying when you just kill everything is really, really the bad stuff. If you've got a serious pest and you want to take a spray bottle and spray the leaves, at least that's targeted, right? You're not getting it everywhere and killing everything. Well, I mean, Nandina is poisonous. There's no getting around that. So it's poisonous for your, for birds, for pets, for people. Um, so you know, I, I'm, I'm assuming there's some number of berries, some amount of, of ingestion that has to happen for the bird to actually die. But that thing, all that thing is also very difficult to study, right? The birds come in, they strip the berries, they fly off, and it's hard to track the birds and know how many are dying later on. So there have been reports of that kind of thing happening, and I think it's better safe than sorry. So better off clipping the, the berries or using something else that provides safe berries instead of Nandina. Tent caterpillars really are good bird food. Uh, yeah, I mean, when they're abundant, they provide an abundance of food for birds. Uh, cuckoos, yellow-billed cuckoos, black-billed cuckoos are actually really good at getting those caterpillars, and they really don't mind all the hairs on those caterpillars. So it's a balance, right? Uh, when, when there is an insect that really takes over and is killing stuff, probably means there's an imbalance in the ecosystem and there's not enough predators to go around. But by having a healthy ecosystem in our yards with a variety of plants, then we're providing more checks and balances. We're trying to provide <coughs> habitat for not just the, the foliage eaters or the pollinators, but also for the predaceous insects that keep the other insects in check. So if we reduce our pesticide use, we we restore habitats, plant native plants, we're trying to create a balance so there are predators to keep those tent caterpillars under control so they don't become a real problem. Can back? go back to Nandinas for just a second? Nandinas, popular topic here. Is this the entire Nandina plant that's poisonous or just the berries on the old-fashioned Nandina? My understanding is that all of parts of the plant are poisonous, contain hydrogen cyanide. That's, that's what I know, you know, that a lot of plants contain toxic substances so they don't get eaten. Now, native plants try to use toxic substances to avoid predation, like milkweeds, called milkweeds because they have milky sap. And many insects cannot feed on that. But monarch caterpillars don't care. They've adapted, they've evolved with that. Milkweed beetles, milkweed bugs can feed on that. So, but the problem is when we import plants from Europe and Asia, they come over here and there's nothing that has evolved with them. So they are toxic chemicals that make them so popular because they don't have insects chewing on them, means nothing eats them. And they provide almost no benefit for wildlife around here. What birds like hornworms? What birds like hornworms? <laughs> Yeah, tomato hornworms, yeah, I know where you go with this. <laughs> uh, I mean, they're, they're big, juicy caterpillars, so I imagine any bird that spots one would love to have that. But they're babies. I, I don't think there's any birds that specialize on those. <laughs> but, uh, <laughs> but those, you know, you can, those you can at least control by pulling them off, right? You don't have to resort to Insecticides or neonicotinoids to get rid of them. Interesting 
Flying. Yeah, they become big moths, and yeah, moths are important as well. Moth or whatever yeah. So moths also can be good pollinators for plants. There are some plants that evolved with moths solely as their pollinators, like yuccas. Other questions? Good questions. No, we don't study chickens, sorry. <laughs> just wild birds. Just wild birds, yeah. okay. Because I was going to put, I might run around my garden with chickens to get the corn worms and different things away from my vegetables. Oh. All right, there's a good natural pest control chickens. <laughs> chickens also can destroy your garden too, right? They can rake up and peck out and do a lot of damage, so there's a balance there. You may need to fence the chickens out of some parts of your garden where you don't want them to get around. All right. Oh, in the back. Is there a difference between the beauty berries that have white versus purple berries? As far as I know, there is no difference in terms of nutrition or preference or anything like that. I haven't done the research for that. I don't, I'm not aware of there being a difference. Okay. That's a good question. I will see if I can find anything on that. Okay. If you're in the process of switching over your yard or portions of your yard, that Benjamin Boy Prairie up is a good one because it's yard design. Yes, if you're in the process of converting your yard, you do want to have good yard design. So Benjamin Boat is a landscaper, so he's all about planning it out. Where are you going to put the species? Right plant, right place, still has to be the right place for that plant. You have to know its soil, moisture, and light requirements <laughs> to, have, to be successful in using native plants. The, the general techniques for native plant gardening are no different than ornamental plant gardening. And the same landscape architecture principles apply. You just have to know that over time things will change, plants will move, some will die, some will spread. That's nature. Well, I just like the way he makes it where you can do a switchover without digging up the whole bed. Yeah. 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 yeah, you can also, yeah. Yeah, Benjamin Bo talks about how you can plant into an existing garden bed or an existing lawn to quicken the transition. So again, he, he's got books, he's got websites, he's a, good, he's a lecturer as well, so I recommend Benjamin Bo. He actually came to Arkansas a few years ago to give a talk to Arkansas Audubon Society, which is where I got to meet him and really enjoyed it. But, Last question. Uh, okay, I was told that I was supposed to, this month is a good month to clean out my bird houses and things like that, so, so I did that. and. Now I'm wondering about within my shrubs, and do I take those nests down too, or do I just leave them? She asked about um, cleaning out bird boxes and even cleaning out the nests that are in shrubs and such. So yes, this is the time of year to clean out your bird boxes if you haven't done that, because it's February and our resident birds are going to be starting to nest by the, before the end. Of, well, by the end of the month, they're going to start courting and. <laughs> building nests, so this is the time to get ready for that. Purple martins will be back by the end of the month, uh, so get ready for that. In terms of a natural nest in a shrub or a tree, leave that. Birds are not going to reuse that stuff. It's just going to fall down and become compost. So natural nests, even, or birds may go and, and take that old nesting material and use it for their new nest. Sorry. All right. Thank you everyone, real pleasure. I'm going to be presenting at the statewide meeting in Russellville, giving this talk, but also a talk on birds and climate change. Thank you, Dr. Dan. Okay, and thank you so much, Dan, and I hope most of you will get an opportunity if you go to state conference to see Dan again. Thank you. It's the end of our program part of the meeting, so we'll go on to our regular business part of the meeting now. We'll start with our officers' reports. Uh, our secretary, Elaine.
Is that work? from dues and a little bit from the calendars and um, you can see the expenses also if you have any questions about those just give me a holler so in our let's see what you call that the master gardener bank account we have twenty six thousand four hundred and thirty eight dollars and some cents and in the depository account we have seven thousand two hundred twenty nine dollars and some cents so our total cash funds is $33,667.69, and we're working on spending that. <laughs> Hi, we have 95 members present today, and we have six guests. When I call your name, would you please sit up so we can recognize you? We have John Davis. Don Norman, Angie Boyle, Alicia Patrone, Kay Greens, and if you know of anybody that needs a sunshine card call something, let me know or let Hildy know. Thank you. Um, I know all of you in here probably have already signed up for a committee assignment. Uh, it came out as an electronic uh, uh, Link, link that you could go to and then select the committees you wanted to work on. If you were unable to use that electronic link, I do have my laptop with me today in a hot spot. I'll be happy to help you with it. We are encouraging our members to use that link because it creates a spreadsheet that our chairs can use. It gives them that email and phone number automatically. Many of the chairs are already contacting their committees with these new updated committee lists to get things started. So please, please use it. Now we will have sign up next month on paper copies for our new Master Gardeners, but we do encourage you to use that electronic lake and we will help you today if you need help. Second, I know they're going to be talking a lot more about the luncheon next month for our new Master Gardeners. I did want to let you know in advance, our program next month will be Janet Carson. She will be doing a program on Gardens in Transition. So I hope all of you will be able to attend and enjoy meeting the new Master Gardeners and having a fantastic lunch. love talking about those first year master gardeners they are so energetic um, they had to miss one of their training sessions so they will graduate march 2nd just so you kind of have are aware of that you know the weather around here is crazy uh, but we look forward to meeting them we'll do a slideshow so they kind of get an idea of what they look like um, and then we will also have as gail mentioned that opportunity for them to sign up with committee chairs so the committees will have their things laid out and have an opportunity to recruit them 
before the meeting. So we're gonna let them come early. You guys come at your normal time, you know, have, we're gonna have a luncheon and, and it'll kind of work through that. Make sure you pay for lunch. And um, so after that, we will also have some four, four additional sessions for our first year Master Gardeners, just to give them a little continuing education. And I only let you know so that you can kind of help them adjust. Welcome them on your committees when they come out. They'll probably kind of start coming in the next few weeks. And um, so if you see a face that you don't recognize, ask them what their name is and where they're coming from. It's been kind of a long time with COVID too, so it might be that some people are starting to get active again. But thank you. All right, next up was be our county agent. But as you know, he is at the fairgrounds. He's in charge of the training. Um, in fact, this week is, is uh, Garland County's week to host. So Luke is out there today, so we'll miss his, his report. Um, unfinished business. Again, the project committee and project sign up, it is going well. Uh, Pam has already sent out a first pass um, to all the committee chairs of people who have already signed up. There will be other reports coming out and, as we close that down later on. Uh, plant sale and garden show. Sheila. Hey everybody, we're hanging in there, right? <laughs> so my name is Sheila McLarty and my part on the plant sale and garden show this year is just the free public educational piece of it. So for any of you guys that are newer to the organization or if you're a guest, Sometimes we hear that referred to as the Expo. That's an old name for it, but now it's combined with the plant sale. So that's the, that's the component that's mine. I will tell you, I've got, I probably have room for maybe six more booths for free public education. And I've got certain topics that I know that the public wants to know about. Um, and I'm looking for people who maybe who have a specialty in those things that might want to staff a booth for both Friday and Saturday. So I may be calling you, but if you're sitting out there and you have a specialty in something, it may be orchids, it might be succulents, it might be composting, it might be rain barrels, it might be, um, and you have an interest in doing that, would you get in touch with me please? And I'm in the roster, it's McClarty, M-C-L-A-R-T-Y. Okay, now I am Claudette Cooper. <laughs> She's in Seattle at a fabulous garden show, and it's also her birthday, if you have a chance to send her a greeting. I have been getting lengthy texts from her about what we are to discuss. <laughs> You saw me with the box of the business cards for the plant sale and the garden show. She wants you to continue to be encouraged to get those and hand them out anywhere you may go to random strangers, family members, or friends. I have a whole box full here if you've run out, seriously. Um, Claudette, let's start with plants, okay, since it is a plant sale garden show. This year, for the first time, we are offering Master Gardener plants both days, Friday and Saturday, all right? And you know, usually it's just been one day until we were sold out. So y'all, that puts pressure on us for plants. And I know the greenhouses are feeling lots of pressure to have lovely, sellable, uh, labeled plants for sale. But for all of you that did some digging in the fall, we really, really need those plants. And if you've not done digging in the fall, if there's something you can be digging now, like some of the perennials, you know, daisies or rudbeckias or you know, things that could be uh, done now, we really ask you to please do that. And if you need help with some potting at your house, you've just got so much to divide that you need help, I promise you we can get you some help. Now the person that's going to be the point person for that is our own Gwen Southern. So stand up. <laughs> She's your gal that can coordinate the pot parties. <laughs> Don't let her look spoil you. <laughs> okay, also for 
for you folks at home that are giving us plants. We love you. We thank you. We need to know what color they are. The public doesn't like the grab bags that we don't really know what color it is. That's not what they like to buy. So Claudette wanted me to tell you, please know the color of your plants if there's any way for you to do that and mark them that way. Do you need labels created for, you have 400 plants and you need labels created. Guess what? We have people that like to do that too. Old, that Claudette would appreciate it if we could get all the plants there by middle of the day, by noonish. And let me tell you why she wants that. It, it, that's the ideal thing. Because we've got vendors, all the garden show vendors that she's recruited, and they're pulling in and loading in their stuff, and she's afraid we're going to have a traffic jam. So we want to get plants delivered on the 27th. That's on Thursday the 27th. And uh, the show starts on Friday, the 28th at 9 a.m. All right, that's the plant part. Moving on to Trash to Treasures. Um, Jennifer Jennings is our leader for Trash to Treasures. Thank you, Jennifer. And so if you have got trash that could be someone's treasure, we want to get that to the fairgrounds. What they want to do is have the Trash to Tre Treasures delivered on Wednesday the 26th. So that gives you a chance to get all that stuff in there and gives them a chance to sort through it and set it up and whatnot. So Trash to Treasures delivered to the fairgrounds Wednesday the 26th. Plants delivered the 27th by noon ideally. Anything else Jennifer we need to know about Trash to Treasures? Mm -hmm. <laughs> Well, you don't want like hospital beds and stuff. Like that. <laughs> I, I guess, but hey, you know what? Guess what? You can do some cute like fairy gardens and stuff with like little stuff you wouldn't think would be plant related, right? So I mean, <laughs> Jennifer. Oh, Jennifer says no. She's not a sport. <laughs> What time on Wednesday? Not usually nine to twelve. By twelve? <laughs> well, <laughs> as close as possible. I was just gonna put in the newsletter. What time? Nine to twelve. Nine to twelve. You want to do morning? Morning. Yes. Okay. Indeed. I'm sure you'll get more communication about this, but she really wanted to get it out, you know, today while we're all gathered. And so keep the questions coming. That's good. All right, uh, moving from trash to treasure onto wagons. We need wagons for the customer service people to help our guests to their car with their plants and their treasures. Um, if you've got a wagon that could be available, we'd like for you to please label it well so that we know that it's yours. And we're going to have customer service using these wagons and not just random public. So you should be able to get them back. The plan is you would get them back. Um, so if you have a wagon available, please try to keep in mind that we, we would need those. And I would say bring those on Thursday or very early on Friday, the day of the sale. The, the uh, sale starts at 9. But if you could bring them up on Thursday, have them labeled real good, then you know they're going to be secured at the fairgrounds. Okay, moving from that to signage. Um, Claudette wanted you guys to know that if you have from last year any the large signs, not the smaller yard signs, but the bigger ones, if you have those from 2022, she asked that they be taken to the extension office. Is that right, Tina? Uh, yes, the big signs. The big okay. signs. Can I say something while we're doing this? Sure. Okay. All right. So, uh, for everybody. <laughs> for everyone who had a sign last year, we're doing the same thing we did last year. We ordered 50 new signs because the dates have changed. So for the small signs, it wasn't worth it to try to change everything on the small signs. The new signs are going to be double-sided, so we can put in your yard. <laughs> I guess if people can come in and go in and see uh, information about the next sale. If you have a, a sign from last year, a small sign, Throw it around, throw it out. But I do need these guys. <coughs> if you can bring these guys for our next meeting, that would be great. I'll get them all together. And then we'll hand out new signs for you guys. So everybody who's willing to put a sign in the yard and have 50 of them, we would really appreciate that. We do have things 
six or eight large signs, and then when I was watching them, they would drop back. I do, we already heard of those. Yeah, they're a little pricey, mm -hmm. so that's good. So everybody could hear that, right? Um, just outline it right quick, what that was. Okay. If you have the large signs from last year, take them to the extension office. They are refurbishing them. Or bring them here. Or bring them to the meeting next month. Uh, the large signs. Yeah, it's it, it's going to be a it's going to be everybody skate next month with all the new master gardeners and. Janet, and so bring your signs. Um, if you've got the small yard signs that have the little metal uh, stand, those also are an expense. And so if you just want to pull the metal stand out and bring those, then that would be terrific too because we don't have to buy as many. But don't bring the small signs, just the stands that she held up. Okay? You know, two months. This is when we all get jiggy and zippy, right? <laughs> Time to start thinking about it. Okay. Um, last thing I've got for Claudette. Aren't y'all glad? This is the end. Um, she had. She was hoping the flyers would be ready this week, and they weren't. But they. But the flyers, the larger flyers that we put in windows of businesses, you would put in community bulletin boards. Uh, whatever, those flyers are going to be at the extension office by Monday. So please pick those up and put them on your community bulletin boards, businesses, uh, so we can start seeing those around town as well. So they'll be ready on Monday at the extension office. Does anybody have a question that I might have a hope to answer? <laughs> Is someone putting it in the newspaper? Probably. There's a publicity group. Yeah, thank you for asking that. There's a publicity group, and so we'll be dealing with newspapers, radio, and uh, social media. I'm not a newspaper, but we can bring bulbs to the plant sale. Bulbs, yes. And, if you, you know, bag them up, and if you know what color they are, that's kind of a big thing right now. So tell us what color it is, what kind of bulb it is, and bag them up. Okay? All right, thanks, everybody. All right, next up, Tricia, our uh, 2024 state convention. Well, things have started. So the contract has been signed with the convention center. So we have a place that's good. So it is May 30th through June 1st. 2024 and we've started working uh, the most immediate needs are the announcement um, for hot springs at the end of the 2023 convention we do a little skit or a little something special to say hey folks hot springs is next and Elaine is in charge of that and if you would like to help her she would appreciate it and we're also looking hard for speakers because you know you got to get those like a year in advance so Gail is working on that and if you have any ideas for speakers she would appreciate it and the other groups you know they're finding looking for the gardens to go on our garden tours and they're looking for stuff to put in goodie bags. And for y'all that have been at conventions, you know what's good, what's kind of eh. So let us know. You know, we won't force you to help us, but you know, we would appreciate your input. And we are needing two chairs. One is for the transportation. And what this person does, once the garden tour people said this is where we're going the transportation guy or woman will um, determine the buses and the bus route they'll be a liaison with the bus company and we also need a chair for the pre-conference tour and this is something to it's an all-day tour and it's got to be special. So, ideas would be wonderful. And it doesn't have to be just hot springs. 
It can kind of be in surrounding counties too. Plus out in Garland County. So anybody want to do that? <laughs> you laughed. You're it. <laughs> That's what happens. All right. Next up is June Ann Green. She's going to tell us what we're going to eat next month for our uh, March, our welcome luncheon for the new Master Gardeners. I'm yeah. sorry, I have a question. Yeah. What was the date for the um, state convention again? May 30 through June 1. Thank you. Hello, everyone. Uh, as you know, we're going to be having our first event uh, on March 17th for the new Master Gardeners. Okay, 16. Sorry. <laughs> Day late, dollar short. <laughs> anyway, we're going to be having, um, it's going to be Western style. Um, that's our theme for this year. And we're going to have pulled pork. We're going to have mac and cheese, baked beans, and coleslaw. And along with it, of course, we're going to have uh, iced tea and buns and chips because I'm going to be making this uh, <laughs> beer, yeah, <laughs> cowboy caviar, and uh, I think you'll really enjoy it. I think it'll really be nice. One of the things that we're going to be doing new this year is we're going to have a contest, and it's going to be cornbread contest, and it's going to be sweet. One category is sweet, and the other category is going to be southern. So we've got our judges prepared, and we're also going to be giving out prizes. So please let me know, or let Teresa know, um, if you'd like to be one of the individuals that want to make some cornbread and that we can all try out. And it can be, I mean, you're loaded, whatever you want, jalapeno. But um, that's one of the things we're going to be doing. The other thing is we'd like to, because it is going to be like the wild, wild west, you know, western style, if maybe we could um, dress a little bit to that effect. I think it would be a lot of fun. And um, if anyone has any um, ideas in regards to um, uh, decorations or anything like that, Teresa is going, is inviting, uh, she's with the Garden Guru, she's the chairman of it, and she can tell you what we're going to do out on the, I do believe it's the 27th, yes, at the church, at her church, so if you want to come up here and let them know what you're going to be doing. Thank you, ladies and gentlemen. Thanks. 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 For those of you that attended our chair um, tea in December, we had uh, tea cups and tea saucers. And so what we're going to do is, those of you that didn't take them home with you, and we have a lot of extras, we're going to make little bird feeders for each of the new master gardeners. So what we're going to do on the 27th, we're going to meet at 10 o'clock at Center Fork Baptist Church, and there's going to be something in the newsletter this next Monday, and there was this past Monday. I'm going to have four tables set up, and um, if, you can kind of let me know, but we're not going to set a limit on who attends this first garden guru. Just if you want to come, show up at 10 o'clock. I'm going to have four tables set up. One is to uh, make the bird feeders out of the teacups. The next one is the magazines. We're going to roll, the, roll 30 magazines up and tie a bow on them for each of the new master gardeners. And then we're going to do name plays. I'm not sure exactly what. It's a root beer bottle with a cowboy hat and a bandana, and it's going to have their name on it. That's going to be set at each of the tables. I mean, for each of the new master gardeners. And then the last one, on each of the tables, the round tables where we eat, we're going to set up with a small hay bale. So we need some ribbon put on that and um, sunflowers. We'll have all the supplies at the church that morning. You just come. We're going to have refreshments. 
this is kind of a time of fellowship and have fun and then put some crafts together. So, thank you. Um, Santa Fort Baptist Church, it's on um, Southmore Road. Teresa, could you give us the timeline of the March meeting then? Like 10.30, the new Master Gardeners comes and the Yes. But then what? Um, 10.30, the new Master Gardeners come, and then um, we're going to have the board set up for all the different committees they can sign up. Then what time will we start eating? 11.30-ish? 11.30, we'll start eating, and then 12.30, the meeting will start in here. Any questions? Oh, yes. The date again, February 27th? February 27th. The day before my birthday. Okay. So, February. <laughs> it's my birthday party. <laughs> okay, thank you. Okay, uh, the last of our new business is the May Garden Tour. And Carolyn, where is Carolyn Davis? There she is. She'll come up and Tell us what you what you've got organized so far. There. <laughs> oh yeah. If everyone will mark their calendars May the 18th, rather than having our regular monthly meeting, we will be doing our annual garden tour. We have six houses that we would go into. Two will be in Lotus Valley, two will be in Arbor Gate, and then the other two will be off of Carpenter Dam Road. We will have maps, addresses, and everything for you at the April meeting. So plan to come, we're looking forward to it, and our homeowners are just being so gracious to open their yards for us to get to tour, so thank you. Um, I wanted to, as far as announcements go, I wanted to make sure everybody saw the sow and teal table over here attracting birds to our feeders. There is a drawing for a little birdhouse. If you haven't put your name in the hat yet, make your way over there and do that and we'll announce the winner in just a minute. Um, the new Master Gardener training is going on, as you know, today. Um, every, let's see, we have three more, I believe, or two more. Um, you are invited to attend those meetings and, and get some educational hours in for yourselves. You need, if you want to do that, you have to sign up at the extension office ahead of time and pay your $10 lunch cost for that day. Um, they're limited space because it's a really big group out there, so please sign up if you want to go. Um, Let's see, we've already talked about the new Master Gardeners coming in at 9.30 on, at our next meeting. Conference registration for the, the state conference for this year is in Russellville, and it's June 8th through the 10th, and you've probably already all seen the registration link, but the registration is open to everybody now, so if you want to go, please sign up ahead of time. 2023 dues, past due. So if you have not paid, please send your check in to our treasurer, Denise, or to the extension office. And if you're one of the ones who have not paid, you will be getting a late notice mailed to you with a return address envelope for you to send that check in. There's going to be a cutoff. We haven't, don't know what that date is yet, but if you have not sign, uh, sent in your dues, you're not eligible to continue being a certified master gardener. Okay. Please send in your dues. Um, one more quick announcement and then we'll do the drawing. Um, about the chairs here again. Um, there's been some confusion about how we need to do that. When we put our chairs up at the end of the meeting, the, chair, the setup committee loves your help and would love for you to continue doing that. We can only stack the chairs eight high and only eight of those roller things are full. If, if those are full, we leave the rest of the chairs where they are. So the committee asked that we start at the back of the room and 
And once we're full, leave the rest. Does that make sense? It makes sense. Okay. All right, our drawing. All right, our winner is Pat Zeller. Are you still here? Oh, yeah. And we are adjourned. Thank you.